Hi, welcome to Faith. I'm Pia Owens. In this four-week series, Divine Direction, Pastor Rusty talks to us about how the choices we make today leads us in one way or another tomorrow, but when we trust in God, we're headed in the divine direction. Now here's this week's message. Okay, before I get started this morning, first of all, let me congratulate you. You made it, okay? Between spring break and the time change, you got here and got here on time. You should be proud of yourself, and I congratulate you. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, you can help me communicate to all of those other derelict schmucks that forgot to set their clocks forward uh, to be on time next week. But also, I want to make sure that you understand we just played, prayed for blessing because at the early service, we dedicated all of these quilts that you see uh, up here on our set today because we have a great, uh, we have a great group of, of of people here, disciples here, uh, our quilting ministry, and all year long they work on these quilts so that on this day we can uh, dedicate them and then send them out into the world through Lutheran World Relief uh, to find their way to people who not only need warmth, y'all, they need hope. They need to know that there are others around the world who, who care about them, who pray for them, and who don't just uh, offer up empty words, but also use the, the skill of their hands to help them in a meaningful way. That's what these quilts are. They aren't just a symbolic gesture. They're a meaningful ministry of this church, and that's just one of many. So I want you to keep that in mind, because I think it's good to be a part of a church that, that is about something significant. Don't you? Don't you think that? Yeah. Me too. But that doesn't just happen by accident. That happens because we have decided to be that church. And so that brings me to the video we have. How many of you make your decisions in life like that? Huh? With, with, your, with your magic eight ball or some other kind of superstition that you might have. Okay, I'm not going to ask you to ante up. But I know uh, that some of you are out there. But that's why we're in the middle of this, uh, this series entitled Divine Direction. Today is week two of our four-part series. And this series was really born out of the number one question in its various forms that pastors like me uh, get more than any other. And that question is this, Pastor, what does God want me to do? What does God want me to do? So in this series, what we're really talking about is how we can all be more faithful and effective in the decision-making that we have to engage in on a day-to-day -day basis. Realizing, y'all, that the decisions that we make today will dictate the stories that we tell tomorrow. Huh? That who we are today is a direct result of the decisions that we've made in the past, and moreover, who we will become in the future is a direct result of the decisions we're making right now. Realizing that if we really do want to get to a greater place, if we really do want to fulfill our purpose, if we really do want to honor God in a meaningful way, then we need divine direction. Because we aren't capable of doing that all on our own. That's why we kicked this off last week by establishing the truth that asking the question, what does God want me to do, is actually the wrong question to begin with. A better question to begin with, you might recall I said, was asking, what does God really care about? Because when you know what God cares about, then it's easier for you to decide what God wants you to do in any and every situation. And what God cares about is the who before do and the why before what. He cares more about who you are, or at least who you are trying to become, than what you're doing and where you're doing it. He's more concerned that you actually are trying to live a life bearing the fruit of the spirit of love, compassion, grace, mercy, kindness, more so than he cares about what vocation you're in or, or, what, or what recreational activity you're all about, okay? He cares about who before do, and God cares about why before what. I told you last week, motives matter to God. The why you're doing something is more important than the what you're actually doing, at least to God. In fact, I use the example. If you give somebody a compliment, why are you doing that? Are you doing that because you really want to build them up, lift them up, uh, affirm them? Or are you doing it so that they will think better of you? You doing it for them or are you doing it for yourself? See, motives matter. Well, that leads us to today. And what I really want to talk about today is... How can we grow in our decision-making? If we know what God cares about, 
Now it's time for us to move on to deciding what does God want us to do? How can we grow in our decision making? And really, that's a question, y'all. How can we grow in our decision making when we know we live in a, a world and a time where, where decision making might be more difficult than ever before because we live in a, a, a time and an, an age where we have more information and choices that like never before? And it's, it's hard for some people. They get overwhelmed with all of the choices. How can we grow in our decision making in the midst of a 21st century world? Well, it's really not all that complicated, you know. Seriously. I mean, if you really are a faithful follower of Jesus, God will show you exactly what he wants you to do, exactly when he wants you to do it. And when God reveals that for you, you'll have absolutely no doubt. You'll be 100% sure that that's what you're supposed to do. And God will validate that by making sure that the problems, challenges, and obstacles that might rise up before you are easily overcome. That is, if you're really a faithful follower of Jesus. And everything I said after, it's really not that complicated, was untrue. Because it doesn't work that way at all for anybody. It certainly doesn't work that way for faithful followers of Jesus Christ, y'all. In fact, I know that to be a fact because, you know, there's an enemy of God at work in the world. There's an enemy of God of work at work in our life. And the truth of the matter is he's not going to let it be that easy for us. And if it ever is that easy, then it might be because we're doing the wrong thing to begin with. That's a sermon for another time, though, okay? But listen, I know many Christians that think that's the way it works. If I just love Jesus enough, God will show me exactly what he wants me to do, exactly when he wants me to do it. I'll be 100% sure, and any problem, challenge, or obstacle that comes up will supernaturally be taken out of my way. But that's just simply not the way it works. And you, you, you don't have to take my word for it. It, it's, it doesn't work that way because I said it doesn't work that way. Jesus said it didn't work that way. Jesus said to his first disciples, his first followers, if you're going to be my disciple, then you have to forsake yourself and begin to serve everyone else. If you're going to be my disciple, he said, you're going to have to pick up your cross and follow me. And the cross is heavy. The cross is hard. The cross is oftentimes painful. Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, it's going to be a really difficult journey, so difficult that you're going to need help. You're going to need an advocate, and I'm going to send you one. He's called the Holy Spirit. It's, an, it's a spirit of wisdom and truth and counsel and might, and you're going to need it because this is going to be hard hard so I want to share with you a passage that I think is fascinating as we consider this particular truth for each and every one of us it actually comes from the apostle Paul and kind of as a sidebar before I dive into the scripture today you know Paul uh, if anyone <laughs> anyone understood what God wanted them to do it have to be Paul I mean, the dude wrote most of the New Testament. You know that, right? Huh? Paul encountered God in heavenly places, and he encountered Jesus face-to-face -face on the Damascus Road. Paul planted churches successfully in just about every corner of the known world of his day. Look, if anybody understood the divine desire of God, it was Paul, which is why I have chosen him as an example for what you and I can expect from our life of faith and discipleship as well. We ought, to, we ought to learn from Paul. And this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, beginning in verse 5. He writes to the Corinthians saying, Now after I go, go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you for a while, or even spend the winter, so that you can help me on my journey, you know, wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit, I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay on in Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door of effective work has opened for me. But there are many of those who oppose me. Now, I'm going to stop there. And beyond the fact that I'm sure it shocks you to learn that there were people that were opposing Paul in, at, at Ephesus at some point in time. I know that's probably a shock, but it did happen. He did get opposed. But what I really want you to see in this passage, y'all, is in verse number six, did Paul say, look, I'm going to come to you in a couple of months and I'm going to stay for about six to eight months. Did he say that? No. 
what, here's what he said. He said, perhaps I'll come and spend some time with you. Perhaps is a word of uncertainty, by the way. Perhaps I'll come and spend some time for you. And then he wasn't very specific about how long. Maybe for a while. Maybe for the whole winter. Who knows? Huh? But I'd like to come and do that so that you can help me prepare for my journey, you know, wherever I go after that. That sounds completely uncertain to me. How about you? Huh? I'm not sure if I'm coming, but if I do, I'm not sure how long I'm staying. And even if I do, I need you to help me to prepare for wherever I'm going to go, and I'm not sure where that is. That's completely uncertain. Or or how about this? How about verse 7? Did Paul say in verse 7, listen, God has appeared to me, and he has called me and directed me to come to you, and I'm going to do that. Is that what he said? No. Here's what he said. He said, I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits it. If the Lord permits it, because the Lord may not permit it. The Lord may not call me to do it. In fact, to tell you the truth, I, I know I need to stay here in Ephesus right now because there's a door that has opened, and, and, and there are people who are opposed to me. So if the Lord permits it, my, my point is this, y'all. There were many times in Paul's ministry where he had no clue what was coming next for him or for the people who he was called to to serve there were many times in Paul's ministry where he didn't have all the facts he didn't have all the details he didn't have all the information and yet and yet Paul was one of the most faithful and effective followers of Jesus Christ the world has ever known now how'd he do that how'd he do that in the face of such uncertainty I'll tell you how I think he did it I think it's because Paul above every other choice that he had to make in daily life. And you know what? He had to make daily choices just like us. He had to decide what to wear, what to eat, where to live, what to do. He had to make all those decisions too, just like you and me. But above every decision he had to make in daily life, first and foremost, Paul decided to trust God. He decided to trust God, especially when he didn't have all the information, especially when he didn't have all of the details he chose to trust God and because he chose to trust God even though he didn't have all of the facts he always had hope he always had joy and Paul always had a plan that was of course always subject to God's amending that plan can you imagine what our life would look like you and I if we were faithful enough to make a plan and yet trust God so implicitly that we'd allow him and invite him to change that plan as he saw fit, that would you, can you imagine what our life would be like if we didn't need all of the facts and information before we dared to act boldly in the name of Jesus Christ? Can you imagine what that life would be like? <laughs> yeah, some of you imagine it and it scares the life out of you, doesn't it? Come on, be honest. I get it. I get it. That's why we're talking about it. But look, if you find yourself like Paul today, facing an uncertain future, maybe even an uncertain next step for you or for people that you care about, I want you to take some comfort in this. God does not always show us all of the facts, all of the information, all of our future all at once. That's a truth. But God always desires, always desires to direct our steps. God does not always show us all of the information all at once, but he always desires to direct our steps. Again, I didn't just make this up. Let's go go to Proverbs. Hang on. Let me go to Proverbs 16. Let me get there myself. Proverbs 16, 9. This is what we hear there. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their, say it with me, He establishes their steps. The Lord establishes their steps. Or how about this one? This one might be actually more familiar to you. It comes from Psalm number 119, um, verse 105. David writes, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. So what does that mean? To have a light unto your feet and a light for your path. Because that kind of light only only illuminates one step at a time. And that's my point. 
God doesn't promise to give us all of the information all at once. He doesn't promise to show us the entire pathway all at once. He doesn't promise to show us our, 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 our complete journey all at once. And to be quite honest with you, for some of us, we better be thankful of that because it would, it would be altogether scary. What God does promise to do is to guide our steps step by step, to be a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. Because step by step is really the only way to faithfully and effectively follow God, to follow his divine direction. That is, of course, if we choose to do so. It is a choice, you know. God does not, God does not direct our steps by compulsion. He doesn't do it that way. He does it because we, we surrender and we allow him to do that. Because while God promises to, do, to guide our steps, we aren't puppets on a string, my friends. We were created and given freedom, freedom to make a choice. And God says, I want you to make a choice. And we do. We have to make that. We have to decide whether we're going to let God divide, uh, guide our steps step by step like Paul did or whether we're actually going to always do what we think is best, first and foremost. BT Dub. If you're one of those people who always do what you think is best, first and foremost, here's my question to you. How's that working for you? Huh? How's that working for you? In fact, turn to your neighbor right now. You ask them, how's that working for you? Go ahead. Ask them. How's that working for you? <clears throat> how's that working for you? Because you can choose it. How's that working for you? We get to make a choice, my friends. We get to choose <clears throat> whether we will let God uh, guide our journey step by step or whether we're going to require all of the information, all of the facts, all, all, of, the, all of the clarity that we require to, to take a next step of any kind to follow God's direction. I know a lot of Christians that are like that, a lot. They insist that God do things their way. They're always taking their plan to God and saying, God, I need you to, to validate this. I need you to do it on my timetable. I need you to do it in, in, in my season. I need you to do it in a way that's going to be most convenient for me. Instead of surrendering their plan to God and saying, I want to do things your way. I want to do things your way. In fact, I know a lot of congregations that live life like that together. Oh, not this congregation. But other congregations much like ours, you see, sometimes require that they have all of the information, they have all of the facts before they'll ever take a, a step in any new direction. In fact, what they really require of God is that God show them a step of absolute clarity instead of leading them to take a step of faith. What I know is a lot of congregations will spend a lot of time mired down in studies and meetings and discernments because they want to play it safe, make sure that they don't, they don't make anybody upset, keep everybody happy instead of realizing that they were put here to honor everybody, but to only please one. I know a lot of congregations, y'all, going nowhere, doing nothing significant, not because they're bad people, it's because they're always trying to do what's reasonable, what's affordable, and what's palatable to them, instead of doing what's right in the eyes of God and the eyes of others. Now look, maybe I'm wrong. But I choose to believe that many of you came here today, that many of you logged in online with us today because you actually do want to make more faithful and effective decisions. Am I wrong? No. Okay, good. I, I think that many of you are here today because you do want to do what's right in the eyes of God instead of just doing what's reasonable, what's politically correct in the eyes of the world. I think that you're here because you do have a heart of faithfulness where you say in your own way, God, just show me what to do and I will do it. And I want to commend that in you. I want to commend that in you today. But I also, if you're in that place, was sent here to say something very specific to you on God's behalf. God wants you to hear this clearly. God says, I won't always show you what to do but I will always give you wisdom to decide. God says, I won't always show you what to do. Now, sometimes God shows us what to do. Sometimes he shows us what to do and when to do it and how to do it. I mean, like the burning bush that Moses encountered, right? It does happen. It just doesn't happen that way very often. 
God says, I'm not always going to show you what to do because I'm more concerned with the who than the do. I'm more concerned with the why instead of the what. I'm not always going to show you what to do, but I am always going to give you the wisdom to decide. That's why I want to spend the rest of the time that we have together today, y'all, talking about the importance of wisdom in our decision making and and, and trying to help you to to understand how we can best let God lead us into making wise decisions for ourselves and for others. And to do that, I want to go to a different proverb. Now listen, uh, you might be wondering, hey, how many proverbs are we going to read? Well, there's a reason that we're diving into the book of Proverbs. Anybody know that reason? Because it's a book of? Wisdom, that's exactly right, and that's what we're talking about, so that's why we're spending so much time here. But, but here's what I want you to hear, okay? Proverbs chapter 4, beginning in verse 5, it says this, Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. For the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Though it costs all that you have, get understanding. Now, there are a couple of observations I'd like to make about this passage as we start this discussion about wisdom. The first one is this. The beginning of wisdom is to know you need wisdom. I mean, look, maybe you've heard it said before that the beginning of wisdom, the, the, the mark of maturity is knowing what you don't know. Anybody ever heard that, knowing what you don't know? Okay, some people attribute that, uh, that saying to uh, the Chinese philosopher Confucius. Some people attribute that saying to the Greek philosopher Socrates. The truth of the matter is, neither one of them has that documented in anything that they ever wrote ever that we have. So I'm going to choose to say that this truth has come to us from God through this proverbist, who we actually believe is King Solomon, but even if it's not Solomon, it's still a word from God for us. I choose to believe this truth is given us to God because that's exactly what he says. Verse 7, the beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Know that you need wisdom. That's the beginning of wisdom, knowing that you need it in the first place. Now, the second point I want to raise is that this wisdom that we're talking about is not, uh, is not inherent to us. It's not indigenous to us. It's not, in our D- it's not in our original DNA. Okay? I know this. And if I didn't know this before, I knew this the minute I had a teenager. It is not inherent to our DNA. You understand what I'm saying? Wisdom, you have to get wisdom. And, and to get wisdom, you can't buy it, you can't make it, you can't manufacture it. There's only one way to get wisdom. You know what that is? The hard way. The hard way. I bet there's somebody in this room or online that has said something to this effect. If you haven't, I bet somebody will eventually. Have you ever heard you, caught yourself saying, if I only knew then what I know now? <laughs> That really is your way of affirming that you had to get wisdom the hard way. That's your way of affirming that, that you weren't born wise. You, do, you weren't wise way back then. You had, to, you had to acquire it through experience and time. Because that's the truth, y'all. The beginning of wisdom is knowing that you need wisdom. That much is true. But to have wisdom, you have to get it the hard way. There's, no, there's really no other way. And then the third thing I want to lift up from this passage is that wisdom is the most valuable thing you can have. Now, notice I didn't say that that, that wisdom is is the most valuable person you can have in your life, right? I didn't say that, that wisdom is the most valuable attribute of your life. The Bible is clear. The most valuable attributes of our life are faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. That's exactly right. That's the most important attributes of life. But wisdom is the most important thing you can have in your life. More important than money. More important than accomplishment. More important than status. More important than the number of Facebook friends or, 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 or Twitter followers that you have. More important than any of that stuff, y'all, whether you believe it or not. It's more important. In verse 6, this proverb says this. He says it's important because... Uh, 
do not forsake wisdom because she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. Now, how many of you would like to have the absolute assurance that you had something in your life that would protect you and watch over you? Come on, be honest. I'm surprised I don't see every hand up. I want, I want anything and everything in my life that will protect me and watch over me and my family. The proverb says that's what, that's what wisdom does. That's what it accomplishes in your life. But, but more than that, he gets more specific in the next verse, verse 7. He says the beginning of wisdom is to get wisdom. That's true, but here's what he goes after that. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. It's that valuable. He says it's that valuable. It's valuable enough for you to give everything in your life that you have because wisdom is more valuable than any of that stuff. So I want to close this message out by giving you three simple thoughts that I, I think will help you uh, move in a more divine direction, will help you move in the direction of wisdom that God wants to lead us all in to help us grow in our decision-making. Okay? And the first thought is this. If you want more wisdom, want more divine direction, then walk with the wise. Walk with the wise. I'm going to turn over to Proverbs 13 this time, verse 20. It says this, walk with the wise. Hmm. So you think I just get clever with all of this stuff that I'm saying. The truth of the matter is I'm not, in, I'm not innovative at all. I just go to God's word and it's right there. It says walk with the wise and become wise. For, uh, for a companion of fools suffers harm. Walk with the wise and become wise. So, so what's it saying? It's saying that the crowd that you run with, or in this case that you walk with, matters. If you'll walk with the wise, you'll become wise. And if you walk with a bunch of fools, then you'll become, well, you get the picture, right? You get the picture. In fact, I'll go as far as to say this. If you'll show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Let that sink in for a minute. If you will show me your friends, I will show you your future. Based on this proverb alone. Because if you're walking with the wise, you're going to become wise. And if you're walking with a bunch of fools, then you're going to wind up in some really, really deep stuff. Now listen. Let me, let me be clear. I, I'm not saying that we aren't meant to love, honor, and respect everyone, including the foolish. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that we should shun and exclude uh, people from our circle of care and concern just because we think that they're foolish or somehow unworthy. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that you should spend all of your time with people who look like you, think like you, act like you, and want what you want. In fact, that's not even healthy for you. You understand that, right? That would bring no diversity at all into your life. I'm not saying any of that. Here's what I am saying. You ready? This is, if you don't write anything down, you better write this down. Here's what I am saying. It is impossible to live a right life with the wrong friends. It's impossible to live the right life with the wrong friends. I think that is what God is trying to communicate to us through this proverb. Is he says, don't walk with fools. And, and what God isn't, he isn't talking about the people that we're called to help and to serve. That's everybody. We're meant to help and serve everybody. We're meant to honor everybody. We're meant to reach everybody. That's what we're meant to do as, as followers of Jesus Christ. That's not the people he's talking about. What he's talking about are the people who are influencing and shaping our lives. That's what he's talking about. Don't walk with fools in that regard. I want to be really clear. That's why I encourage our church. I encourage everybody, by the way, but I especially encourage our mission partners. If you're not already a part of a small group ministry, you need to be. And it's not because I, I want you to do that out of duty and obligation. It's not because I want something from you. It's because I want something for you. And this is what I want for you. Because who you walk with matters. And I don't just mean the adults in the room, y'all. I mean small groups are good for everybody. We have uh, senior high youth small groups, middle school small groups, and small groups even for our youngest disciples, our children. I think everybody should be in a small group ministry. And I'll tell you why. Because the truth of the matter is, is that 
uh, is that we all need committed Christian believers to surround us, support us, and walk with us. That is, if we're going to be wise followers of Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm telling you that because the truth of the matter is coming here for worship a couple of hours each week or so, you know, even if you read the Bible some on your own at home and pray each day, that's good, y'all, but it's not always enough to overcome the pull of the world that's always trying to lead us away from God. We need other Christian friends in our life that are going to help us when we are weak, that are going to advise us when we're lost, that are going to support us when, we're, when, we, get, when we really mess it up. We, we need that in our life. I, I tell you that it's, I encourage you to do that, y'all, because the real key to significant and faithful life is understanding that it's all about, it's all about relationship. It's all about developing relationships that matter. And when we say that's our vision here for everyone, we want to help you, equip you, encourage you, empower you, connect you, all that stuff to develop relationships that matter. We, not just, we don't want you to just have relationships that matter to you. We want you to have relationships that matter for you as well. You want more divine direction in your life? You want more wisdom in your life? You got to start by walking with the wise. And you do that when you commit yourself to more intentional time with other Christian brothers and sisters. If you're not a part of a small group, please, for your sake, your sake, go sign up today right at the Welcome Center. We'll be glad to help you do that. Which leads me to the second thought I want to share with you, and that is this. Once you start walking with the wise, then ask for the wisdom that you want. Ask for the wisdom that you want. James 1, chapter, uh, James 1 uh, verse 2 says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You ready? Here it comes. So if any of you lacks, say it with me, wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. That is not a term of uncertainty. That's a term of absolute certainty. It will be given to you. See, God longs to share his wisdom with us. He, he wants to share his wisdom with us, and he promises to do that. But here's the thing, y'all. If you're going to receive the wisdom from God that you need and desire then you have to begin by spending time with God. He promises to give it. That's absolute. But the way that God chooses to give it is through developing a relationship with us. Maybe you've heard that before. Maybe you've heard before it's all about. Mm -hmm, yeah, that's right. So whenever you do dive into God's word, that is that you read the Bible on your own, and it's not, not just me telling you what the Bible says. It's, it's you discovering it for yourself. You, you, you're not just getting, you know, a, 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 a gold star in heaven for good behavior. God uses that opportunity to begin to share wisdom with you. Whenever you do gather with people in worship like this or in small group ministry, God uses that moment to, to impart wisdom to you. Whenever you pray, whenever you serve, whenever you give generously of all that God has first given to you, he uses every single one of those moments to teach you more about yourself, about his love, and about the world that he longs to save. It's a fact. Jesus himself, by the way, reiterated this truth. I'm thinking about Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse 7. This is what he said. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. And that's, I, I hope that's encouraging to you today. I hope that's empowering because there's a promise behind that. But here's, that promise comes when we take action. God answers when we ask. God opens the door when we knock. God shows and reveals to us when we seek. So ask for the wisdom that you want. Walk with the wise, but then ask for the wisdom that you want. And then that leads me to the third and final thing, and then we'll close it out. The third thought is this. Decide to be decisive. 
This might be the most uh, difficult one for um, many of you, but we've got to decide to be decisive. So look, we were made intentionally and on purpose, and we were made with freedom to choose in mind. God gave us the freedom to choose, starting with Adam and Eve. Sure, he warned them not to eat the apple in the, in the middle of the garden, but did he prevent them from doing it? Did he restrict them from doing it? No, he gave them a choice. We have been created with freedom, my friends, and, and, and we were made decisive, and God expects us to be so. He expects us to make decisions. Even if they're unwise decisions. Adam and Eve made an unwise decision. That much is true. They wouldn't be the only ones, by the way, to make an unwise decision in life. I'm also thinking of a time, though, when the children of Israel were standing on the brink of the promised land, Joshua 24, 15. This is what Joshua said on God's behalf. He said, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, now that would be a really bad decision. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, because you need to make a choice. You were made to make a choice. Whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. You, you were made to make a choice. You were, you were equipped with freedom and the ability to decide. God expects us to make decisions, even if they aren't very good ones. Okay, But because here's the truth. Making no decision at all is the, ver is the worst possible one. I told you last week, whenever we make no decision, it's a choice. And whenever we make that choice, no decision always leads to the same place. You know where that place is? Nowhere. No decision will always lead you nowhere. Every single time. But we hear in James 1, which we read from a few minutes ago, a, a, a different dynamic about making choices. And that is don't make double-minded choices. Don't be wishy-washy. Don't flip-flop. Don't, 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 stay, don't stay middle of the road. And, and, and look, here's what he says. Right after he says, um, if you lack wisdom, ask God, he says this, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Hmm. Well, I love about James, he just didn't mince words. How would you like me to preach like that sometime and just tell you, you double-minded people are just unstable, okay? But my point is this, y'all. I think his point is this. He said, look, when you ask for wisdom that God has promised, then you don't need to doubt. There's no reason to doubt. Then, then, then just get on with it and, 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 and make a decision trusting that God is going to give you wisdom. And it is true, y'all. We were made to be decisive for one single reason, and that is because there is wisdom in every decision. Did you know this? There is wisdom in every decision. I know that a lot of people are so afraid to make a decision because they don't want to make a mistake. Oh, my God, I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to make the wrong decision. Oh, my God, is this the right decision? Oh, oh, oh. And they get so anxious, so uptight, so, so they get ulcers from that kind of stuff, y'all. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you find yourself today or in any other day panicked like that, thinking, well, what if I make a mistake? Here's what I want to ask you. What if you do? What if you do? What if you do make a bad choice? What if you do make a mistake? You know what will happen? You'll gain wisdom. That's what will happen. Oh, sure, you might have to pay an extra bill, a fine, a penalty, a fee. Sure, you might have to do an extra semester of school because you messed around and, and, and didn't do what you have to do. Yes, you might get a few extra scars along the way because you made a pretty bad decision. Okay, I'm not telling you it won't be without consequence, but here's what I guarantee you. I guarantee you, you'll have more wisdom having made a decision, even if it's a bad one, than you would if you made no decision at all. Don't ever forget this, y'all. The wisest people in the world that you, that you actually know didn't become wise because they always made a good decision. They became wise because they made a lot of poor decisions. And they learn from them, including me, including you, inclu including all of us. 
Now, don't get me wrong. Again, I'm not saying that, that we shouldn't be trying to make good decisions. I'm not saying that our decisions don't matter. I'm not saying that I don't try to get it right, whatever it is. I do, and you should. What I am telling you, though, is that you need to claim and embrace the freedom that God has given you and decide to be decisive. Now, I'm going to encourage you not to do that until you've walked with the wise and you've asked for the wisdom that you desire. But once you've done that, then trust your God enough to know this. Every decision brings with it some kind of wisdom. If it, if it winds up being a great decision, you'll have more wisdom. But if it winds up being a poor decision, you'll either know what not to do next time or maybe it will actually teach you the right thing to do next time. Either way, there's wisdom in every decision because your God is with you in every decision. That's what I really need you to know today. You want divine direction, so do I. It begins with having more wisdom in our decision-making, and that happens when we walk with the wise, we ask for the wisdom we need, and we decide to be decisive. We decide to be what God has created us to be, trusting him every step of the way, trusting that we can make plans without all of the information, trusting that what we have right, God will affirm, trusting that where we have an opportunity to get it wrong, God will, God will be there even if we make a mistake because he will never forsake us and abandon us. Don't you believe that? I'm wondering, don't you believe that? And it's time for us to start living our lives like that, both as disciples and as a church. It's time for us to stop playing it safe. It's time for us to stop holding back. It's time for us to stop sitting on the sideline and letting other people uh, do things that we're, we're willing to be critics about but never willing to be participants in. It's time for us to come together as a church, y'all, to do something significant because the world needs hope like never before. The world needs uh, a good news like never before, and we have been entrusted as a church of Jesus Christ to provide that hope, that message, that good news. But it's not going to happen as long as we remain undecisive. I'm not promising you will always get it right. When I ask you to trust me and the other leaders of your church, I'm not asking that you'll trust that we'll never make a mistake and that we'll never get it wrong. I get it wrong sometimes. I hope that doesn't shock you. All I'm asking you to do is to trust that I have the best interest of our church at heart and so do our leaders, and I believe you do too. So it's time for us to come together, walk with each other as we grow in faith and decision-making, ask for God to give us wisdom where we need it, and then decide to do something significant for the sake of the kingdom of God, for the sake of the people he longs to reach. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to come today to hear some hard truth to hear the truth about the fact that it's difficult sometimes for us to make good decisions. It's difficult for us to make decisions in a time and place that we have so many choices like never before. And, Lord, it's difficult sometimes because we get paralyzed by, uh, by our anxiety concerning making a mistake. But here's what we have heard from you today. That living with, with, without all of the information, all the facts, isn't just the, the, the way it has been for a very long time with a lot of faithful people before us. But in truth, Lord, that's the way we learn to trust you. In truth, Lord, taking it step by step and letting you be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path is the way that we grow in our faithfulness and effectiveness. Today, Lord, we know that the beginning of wisdom is knowing that we need wisdom, and we know it like never before. And you've shown us how we can begin to, to get more wisdom. It, it takes time. It, it, it takes experience. But, Lord, that experience includes walking with the wise, surrounding ourselves with Christian believers that will help us discern what you want us to do and when you want us to do it. It, it includes us asking for the wisdom that we desire and trusting that you promise to give it in your own way as you develop a relationship with us we, we we've heard today lord that we need to decide to be decisive because we were made to be decisive and there is wisdom in every decision even the poor ones even the unwise ones the only bad decision we can ever make is none at all because that doesn't glorify anybody that doesn't help anybody that doesn't get us anywhere that just gets us nowhere we know that all things will work together for good for those that place their love and trust in you. And I thank you for these men and women and children of faith today that have placed their faith in you.
Lead us to be a church, Lord, that will give you the praise, honor, and glory. Lead us to be a church, Lord, that isn't just interested in maintaining what we got. Lead us to be a church, Lord, that aggressively tries to grow your kingdom by reaching others with the good news of your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray, and everybody said, amen. And that concludes this week's message, part of the Divine Direction series with Pastor Rusty. If you would like to come to one of our services, we are located at 6000 Morris Road, Flower Mound, Texas. Our service times are 9 a.m. for the classic worship and 1045 for the contemporary worship. Also, the 1045 contemporary service is live streamed on both our app and our website. Till next time, I hope to see you here at Faith.